And once Somebody we have admitted. everybody admitted, um, we'll go. Can ahead I admit all? Oh, sorry. Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Thank Everybody's you. joining now. Great. Welcome, everyone. My name is Erin Beasley. I'm the executive director for Ecosystem Restoration Camps in the United States. Um, that's the nonprofit that works with the ERC Global Movement. I'm really pleased to be here today to, as your host of the first fireside chat of 2022. And we have some really special guests for you. So without any further ado, um, let's jump into our presentation. Just some general housekeeping. Today we'll be hearing from John Liu and Jonathan Cabat, camp manager for Camp Hotlum in California. Um, we'll ask you to hold your questions until after Jonathan's presentation. And you may ask your, person, your question in person or in the chat um, by raising your hand, either um, with the, the raise hand option in Zoom or by making a, a chat to us. Um, we will have the session going for one hour, but please feel free to stay for an open discussion after the presentations. And now we will hear an intro from John Liu. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Are you going to stop sharing there? And yeah, okay. So here I am in Los Angeles, and I'm going to first show you this. Welcome, everybody. So, all right. Have I done this correctly? I believe I have. Hello, I'm John Liu. Welcome to the first Ecosystem Restoration Camp Fireside Chat of 2022. It features the Hotlam Camp on Mount Shasta, which is one of the most important and interesting camps and one which is very close to my heart. I had the opportunity to spend five months at the Hotlam Camp at the early stages of the lockdown during the COVID uh, pandemic in 2020. And it was a magical time for me. I'm now 70 years old, so it was uh, very odd to spend five months in a tent on the side of a, a volcano, but I recommend it to everyone. I was visited by many animals, the eagle and the hawk, and the deer and the bears left lots of indications that they were around as well. And I was able to feel the subtle differences in temperature and moisture. And I was energized by living in nature. I was together with Jonathan Cabot, who you'll be hearing from, who has a a long history in psychotherapy. And so there was a lot of conversation and consideration and contemplation of psychology and social psychology. And we met with indigenous people and experts. And the, and the camp was working to make its landscape as resilient as possible to mitigate the extreme risk of fires. And I stayed there until actually the fires drove us out. Now in 2020, they didn't make it all the way to the Hotlam camp, but the forest road, the national forest road, which you take to get to Hotlam camp was closed. And in 2021, Unfortunately, the fires came through and destroyed the infrastructure and many of the trees in 
Camp Hotlin. And I think this is interesting because it sort of made the determination of Jonathan Cabot, who's the camp coordinator there, to dedicate the camp further to understanding fire ecology and to reforestation and to training more and more people in this. And this is one of the most beautiful places in California with the wonderful volcano, Mount Shasta there, the wonderful wildlife. So you're gonna learn a lot about this and I do hope that you'll help to support Camp Hotlam in this crucial effort to reforest Camp Hotlam and to train people in fire ecology and reforestation. Welcome to the first Ecosystem Restoration Camp Fireside Chat of 2022. Let's all learn together and work together. Thanks so much. So back to you, Aaron. Thank you, John. And it's a pleasure to have you here. I think it's really special that um, we have um, Jonathan's presentation and um, we'll also have you helping with the Q&A session, facilitating some of the conversation after the presentation um, because of your personal experience um, in uh, Camp Hotlam. Um, before we jump into the presentation, I wanna give you guys a couple of updates about what's going on with ecosystem restoration camps around the world. Um, we have a couple of upcoming experiences and courses. Um, Camp Embercrombie based in the UK has a winter rewilding course. Camp Altiplano in Spain um, has a tree planting activity ongoing through February. Camp Human Nature in Uganda has volunteer experiences um, also in February, as well as partners in Farm of the Future in Brazil have activities ongoing um, from February 10th until the 16th. And our partners in California, Camp Coyote, have a camp experience February 11th through the 13th. So if you happen to be anywhere near um, any of those camps and would like to get involved or like to learn more about what activities are gonna be going on, um, that information is available on the ERC website, on the Ecosystem Restoration Camps website. And we also wanted to give you a couple of um, updates from and news from our camps around um, the globe. Camp Tanganyika in Tanzania planted more than 200,000 seedlings during their rainy season. Uh, Camp Rochia Viva in, in, in Italy is also planting bushes in degraded soils using wool for mulch um, as a way to retain humidity and encouraging mushrooms. Camp Contour Lines in Guatemala is training a new cohort of technicians and site supervisors in uh, new villages and communities. So they're expanding their food forest um, and diversified forest programming. Um, our partners at Camp Regenesis in the Philippines have been hit by a typhoon and um, are doing some rebuilding there, um, thinking about how to increase their resilience to extreme weather events in the future. And Camp Desperto in Brazil received 1,500 seedlings from the Brazilian government, which will be planted with the local community. So just to give you some sense of the many activities that are happening around the world right now related to restoration um, and the great partners that are doing that work. Now I'd like to transition our focus to Camp Hotlam. They joined the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Network um, in 2018 and Jonathan is the project lead and camp manager and he'll be talking about his experience at the site and his vision for restoration. Um, I'll I'm going to switch over, Jonathan, to your presentation, um, but please okay. feel free to, to take over. Okay, we'll see how this works. I'm gonna try to get over here so I can see my presentation. 
I think we need to go. I'm not seeing the presentation. Are you showing it? Erin? I think I, I should come up in just a second. Well, how's everybody doing today? I'm really enthused to be here. And we've been through a lot in the last six months. And I hope that, you know, through this conversation, hopefully it's a conversation and not just a presentation, but through this conversation, maybe we can dream into you know, some of the potential that we have. Here we are. Okay, so Hotlam is kind of a vision that I came up with many years ago, walking along the Trinity River. And it came to me that I wanted to support people in contemplative practice in nature. And that led me on kind of a circuitous path and eventually got into clinical psychology but I've always had a love for eco-psychology. And so I originally envisioned a camp that was an eco-psychology camp. And I was having a really hard time finding a location. And Lauren convinced me to look again after being quite discouraged. And the first thing we stumbled across was this location on this side of a volcano, right next to wilderness, which is what I was hoping for. And it was also zoned timber protection zoning. And I'll explain a little bit more of that later. Um, next slide, please. Aaron, can you change the slide? Thank you. Um, so I wanted to kind of speak to why we got involved with ecosystem restoration camps, because I feel like their vision is very aligned with hopefully everyone's vision globally. And um, I met John Liu at EcoCamp Coyote and we talked for hours and he said to me, we must work together. And so back in Colorado, um, worked on creating a memo of understanding between ecosystem restoration camps and ourselves. And the camp kind of got born into a, a new mode. But the reality is that much of why we had to approach it that way was because the land was completely neglected for a hundred years. And prior to that, back in the 1860s, it had been heavily impacted by timber extraction. And so the restoration work was really paramount in our minds. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, skip this one. Next slide. Aaron, can you skip this slide? Thank you. So one of the reasons why I was really, really intrigued with Mount Shasta rather than maybe somewhere else in California was because it had an international kind of mystique. People come from all over the world to come here, not only for just recreation, but for deeper understanding about life and about you know, what it is to be truly human. And next slide, please. And I believe it's always been this way. Um, Hotlam is a Shasta word that means steep. And there were tribal peoples living at the base of the mountain down in what is now um, the area around um, the Shasta River below us in a place called Edgewood. And they were completely displaced um, through a genocide during the 1850s and 60s um, due to the gold rush. Next slide, please.
And then there was a real drive in, in, in the nation to create the transcontinental railroad. And the timber extraction occurred and Hotlum is right outside the town of Weed, which has been purported to be the largest lumber mill in the country at one time. And the lumber was extracted from the area, which we now think of as this area called Hotlum, to build the railroad. And the land was actually given to the railroad um, in order to remove timber. And as you can see here, you know, this was prior to them building railroads in the area to extract the lumber. So they just drew the lumber out with these carts with horses and oxen and the devastation of the very fragile Delaney soil was complete. It really impacted any kind of, you know, biotic system that was there with mycelium and, and it, it you know, started to become desertified at that time. Next slide, please. So Abner Weed um, ended up being a congressman. He was a Civil War um, veteran, became a congressman, and he opened up this rail line. It was a private railroad line that we now have to cross in order to get to Hotlum. And the amount of wood that was extracted from the area is almost unfathomable. So here it says that in 19... 56, the records show that four and a half billion board feet of lumber was extracted from this area. So you can see why they, you know, perceive this as being one of the largest lumber mills in the world. Next slide, please. So, you know, my hope coming into this was that having grown up in California and understanding what was happening environmentally was that we were going to connect more deeply to nature. We were gonna support people through psychological practices and spiritual practices in deeply connecting to nature. And I think of nature as more than just kind of an external thing, but it is this organism in which we actually reside, this organism that we participate in that we are an integral part of. I really believe that humans have been part of the shaping of the biosphere, this living organism, this thin layer of a living organism on the planet Earth. Next slide, please. So we've created a number of objectives. And you know, I won't go into these deeply here, but if anybody you know, wants a copy of these slides, I can send them to them. But I think you know, one of the deeper things that you know, we're working on is to work with people to be able to understand their relationship as, as an intimate other with the more than human world. And I really believe that we accomplished that in many ways while John was there, I think his experience of living primarily outside and in an area that you couldn't just walk to town easily um, really helped us kind of sequester in place in a way that supported, you know, more re-indigeneity. Next slide, please. So why is it important to have this particular zoning in California? I wanted to have a place where we could spend time outside and where people were not, you know, cloistered in walls and within kind of a setting that's, you know, controlled through air conditioning and heating and such. And so the zoning allows for camping and environmental education. And those two single, you know, these, those two entitlements 
were extremely important to my vision. I wanted a place where it was truly a camp. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go through these relatively quickly. We wanted to have a restoration camp where we were doing physical work and having a physically intimate relationship with tending. I truly believe that when we care for something, we fall more deeply in love with it, whether it's a human being that is in palliative care or a child who is recent into this world or animals and plants and places that include all of those. Next slide, please. Eco-psychology I've mentioned before. Eco-psychology is you know, one of my primary loves in the field of psychology. And it's really the study of humans relationship with the rest of the world. Next slide, please. Also, because we you know, had met with members of the, you know, CAL FIRE, which is arguably one of the finest firefighting organizations in the world, we realized that we really needed to work on fuel load reduction and making the place safe for people to visit given the you know, catastrophic fires that we've been having. Next slide, please. We also wanted to help people tend the forest, to learn how to be with the forest in a different way that enable the forest to support the people and the people to support the forest, that it was a two-way relationship. Next slide, please. Wild tending is something that is close to my heart. And I really believe that we need to reacclimate our palate to local plants and local ways of eating shipping food around the world and becoming accustomed to foods that are grown in the tropics or grown in you know, thousands and thousands of miles away and anticipating that we can have those foods year round, depending, you know, not depending on the season, I think is, is quite crazy. And so learning to you know, eat what is local, I think is really, really crucial. Next slide, please. Um, did we miss a slide? Did you download? Did you download this? So I did download the document, Jonathan. This shows as blank for me. You do not have the most recent version of this slideshow. Um, and it's really crucial that we see the next slide. Um, not sure what to do at this juncture. So this is um, the version that was downloaded about five minutes before the presentation. Yeah, it, see if I can find it. Let's see if we can re-download it. I'm sorry, I apologize everyone. The internet is slower than we imagine sometimes with updates. Because it's on your local drive right now, I'm imagining. It is, that's right. Yeah, that's the problem is you're not running it off of Google Drive. So Jonathan, you, you want her to go onto Google Drive and try to reopen the, the thing there? Yeah, either that or I can send her a link. Why don't you just put, oh, oh I, you're on a phone. So, yeah, send it from your computer onto uh, to her and so she can redo it. But, what are you able to see my screen um now let me try to re 
share the screen with the different window. How about now? Can you see yeah. it? Yeah, start that for us. Sorry, everyone, this is slightly anticlimactic. Let's go full screen. I'm not able to um, share this document. You are not. Here we go. OK, I think we're on. We are seeing it. Wonderful, thank you. Hello, I want to I want to thank Gerard Ungerman, who's with us today, for preparing that video for us. Um, I've been re-traumatizing myself for weeks now, trying to prepare this presentation, and looking through literally thousands of pictures of Hotlam during and post the fire, and I think it's really really hard to even fathom what it's like to be near a firestorm. Um, and I think it's even more difficult to fathom what it's like to watch a place that you've become deeply attached to become you know, completely apocalyptic. Next slide, please. So this is you know, the edge of the land where that mastication is. And you can see the size of the billowing cloud of smoke that's towering over this 14,000 foot volcano that you see in the distance. Next slide, please. So here's the before and after picture that um, kind of gives you an indication of the scope of, of this fire. Next slide, please. Then following this fire, we had an atmospheric river, a deluge that flooded much of the Pacific Northwest down into the you know, central California area. And the San Francisco Bay Area, as you can see here, was heavily inundated. Sacramento, the state capital, had the highest rainfall on record. 
Next slide, please. So as you can see, there's this big kind of rut going down the valley there. And over to the left is our road. This is a dry stream bed that completely washed out. Um, nobody knows how much water was actually flowing down there, but it almost shut down the railroad. And they worked for a month or more um, with huge excavation equipment, the kind you'd see at a, um, at a you know, strip mine to try to remove the material that it, you know, piled up against the, against the, um, the railroad tracks. Next slide, please. So the water and the wind basically not only took all the ash off of the property, but it washed the soil completely away. So what used to have some modicum of leaves and duft and some mycelial layer with cryptogamic soils, um, there's nothing left. Next slide, please. And we have incredibly high winds. I, I, sh I shared a, um, a video recently with the folks um, who are coordinators of a wind event that I was at just a little while ago. This is an example of the road that crosses the property, the Multa Road. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the road that actually accesses the property. I was not able to drive a vehicle to the property for a month. And luckily I was able to get some assistance with heavy equipment to be able to access the, the property with a high clearance vehicle. Next slide, please. I know it's hard with these images to see how deep these ruts are, but in many places, they're well over six feet deep. Next slide, please. So what do we do? You know, we are in a time where humanity is truly waking up to the ecological crisis that we're in the climactic catastrophe. And, you know, there are front runners that have been you know, talking about this publicly since the 1960s. But I think we haven't really asked ourselves this question enough. In fact, I don't believe that answers service as much as questions do. Next slide, please. So one of the people that I follow is Jem Bendel. And I know that a lot of people think of ecosystem restoration camps as you know, a biological answer to an ecological problem. But I really believe that the sociological culture that we're growing is primary to being able to do any true work where we are trying to heal our relationship with the biosphere. Next slide, please. I think that developing community is crucial to our success. Maybe it's because, you know, I have this kind of humanistic or what I'd like to call more biohumanistic orientation. I think there's many of us that feel that our human to human relationships are first and foremost where we need to work rather than you know working just you know with kind of a, a mechanistic worldview where we're separate. Next slide please.
Luckily, ecosystem restoration camps has the same orientation. They're not only trying to measure the effects of the restoration projects that are happening around the globe at I believe over 50, over 50 camps now, but they're actually trying to measure the impact on the people who participate in these experiences. Next slide, please. So I have been saying that we don't build communities. We have to grow communities. And there are some real challenges to finding a way to have a functioning community, a healthy community. And there are stages to that development. And these are really, really challenging processes that I'm hoping we can have a conversation about and we may not have the answers, but we know how to experiment. We know how to practice and try new things. It's almost like applying a scientific methodology to our interactions. Next slide, please. You know, the last slide talked about emptiness. Um, this particular model by Bruce Truckman, which is commonly spoken of, doesn't actually go into this idea of emptiness. And having studied Buddhism for years, I kind of appreciate Scott Peck's idea that there's a, a place of stillness. And I'm actually thinking that perhaps the last nine months or six months, especially at Hotlam, have, have kind of brought us into a, a, a kind of quietude. Maybe that's necessary at this time. And I'm really feeling an urgency to get started doing something really practical. Next step, slide please. So we did a biochar training and this video is not public yet, um, but I wanted to play just the beginnings of this um, video for you and we'll stop it in just a few minutes. But to give you an idea of how exciting it can be to be involved in a camp experience. We are in the midst of a twin crisis that's interactive and almost synergistic. Climate change and these large scale, fast spreading wildfires that are, are threatening and in many cases destroying homes and communities. Because of fire suppression and all the things that have happened in the way that our Western colonizing people have been dealing with the land, we have a really serious situation. Indigenous people, used fire in the forest and the impact of the changes of European management makes the, the forest more flammable. A lot of the problem of these wildfires in terms of homes burning down is all the excess down dead woody fuels and vegetation that have accumulated in many cases because we fought fires all these past decades and now they're burning in these conditions of, of climate change. Uh, you know, hot, dry, droughty conditions, strong winds. The native peoples that lived here had a very successful way of managing the forests with fire. Forests were healthy, they were biodiverse. If there was a wildfire, it didn't burn very intensely as a, a low intensity fire. Hotlam Eco Regeneration Camp is a camp on the slopes of Mount Shasta in California, was the traditional territory of what we know as the Shasta people. And tragically, during the gold rush, the Shasta people in the 1850s experienced a almost complete genocide. This area here was held by the railroad for extraction of timber for building the railroad. 
And the impact of that tree removal a hundred years ago, the place is still not recovered fully. And what has come back is fields and fields and fields of brush. And we just have a few trees coming in and there's a lot of dead brush here. With a catastrophic fire that would come through here, the manzanita burns like a crown fire through the leaves and will light the lower limbs. And it's so dense that if a fire came through here, it would devastate everything. So one of the most important things that we're doing here is releasing trees from the encroachment of the brush. This fuel that's actually a hazard on the landscape because it can carry fire and it can make fires worse. Uh, we need to treat that fuel. We need to get rid of it somehow. And so typically the way that is done is that it's piled and burned and just turned into CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And that's one way, but that generates a lot of smoke and it kind of puts carbon back in the sky, which we really want to pull it down from the sky, sink it into the ground. And my first summer here, I was scratching my head and it just came to me, biochar. Why not make biochar and restore some of that carbon, sequester it into the soil and build more healthy habitat for the microorganisms that live in the soil. Once the structure of the wood okay, has been Aaron, we can, we can move on to this material. So that, next slide please. Up. So that, that video will be publicly available at some point in time. Um, I wanted to show that video because I think it's really, really important to understand that you know, we are coming up with some solutions and that the world is taking great note of putting the carbon back in the soil through biochar practices, which have been around for millennia. Indigenous peoples throughout the world have used biochar, most famously down in South America, to create some of the most fertile soils that we have on, on the planet. And I think we need to also be willing to make mistakes. You know, I'm feeling like I spent several years of my life trying to prevent something that I had absolutely no control over. And it's become a daunting kind of task to think about, you know, why continue on? We spent endless hours, months clearing that land and it didn't do any good. We may have saved one or two or three trees out of thousands of trees through our efforts. And it, it's, it's pretty tragic, but I want to encourage people to get out there and, and try. You know, I don't believe we need to leave this important work just to the quote unquote experts. I think that everybody has a role to play. And that's what I love about ecosystem restoration camps is ecosystem restoration camps is making opportunities available for people to participate in this healing practice. Next slide, please. So this is a image, next slide, please, of the area that we're going to be planting 4,500 trees on. It's a 15 acre area. And yeah, that's about eight hectares. Um, and we've been given a grant that pays us after we get the work done to plant 4,500 trees. And in order to do that, we need to do a lot of pre-work where we are preparing the soil for the trees. Next slide, please. So to give you an idea how much that area is, the green line is the property line. 
And so it's just a small portion of the entire property. But as you can see, this raised area is all lava. I'm not really sure how to address replanting that. But you, over to the you know, south west, you see this kind of green washed area with the road cutting across it. That is a derelict plantation that completely burned. But as you can see, it too was a brush field. And it had been planted, I believe, in the 1990s. And only a few of the trees in the very far south, up against the north facing escarpment of lava, were actually taken. For the most part, the Forest Service was unable to replant this area with the practices that were used in the 1990s. Next slide, please. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about techniques. And luckily the Forest Service is exploring a new way of addressing the problems of this climate crisis we're having and the deforestation that has happened and continues to be exacerbated through fire. And people always ask me, so what kind of trees are you planting? And you know, certainly we're considering native trees, especially timber trees, because it's easier to get funding to plant trees that can be later used for building like ponderosa pine and Jeffrey pine. Sugar pine is a very coveted pine that has been primarily wiped out in the area due to its extraction for you know, making things like fruit boxes on Douglas fir has a place. We also have native species like mountain mahogany and canyon live oak. They don't have much commercial value at this point. But then we're also in discussion and I think a lot of scientists are talking about assisted migration and the civil culturists and the culturalists of the Forest Service are certainly taking a, large, a long hard look at assisted migration. So we are looking at bringing in you know, other trees that are not traditionally in that area, maybe more drought resistant or maybe serving a different purpose to try to have a, a more um, robust canopy. But what people are not talking about is, you know, what kind of humans do we want to have at camp? What kind of people do we want to have involved in this? And that's the kind of discussion that I really want to be participating in. One of the most fabulous things that the group in California was able to do was to host a cultural competency workshop. I think there were 200 attendees and it was a one day long workshop via Zoom during the pandemic that engaged people in the conversation about how to interact with and develop alliances and to be allies with indigenous peoples. And it was so profound. And I wanna see more of those kind of things at camps. It's not just ecological restoration that we're doing, we're doing socio-ecological restoration. Next slide, please. So technology-wise, you know, here's an example of a very arid volcanic area in the Mediterranean where they've created these rock walls and these pits to try to address the issues of the wind and the water that we talked about earlier. The winds in Hotland can be really hot, really dry. And in the winter time, we often get 65 mile an hour winds on the side of the volcano. So being able to protect trees from that um, is really crucial and being able to sequester more water in the soil, even though it does drain rapidly, we want to be able to retain as much as we can utilizing shade. Next slide, please. We'll also be looking at net and pan kinds of practices where we are planting in low spots and directing water down the slopes. Right now, the water is kind of running however which way it finds its way down. And we're going to be trying to work with that water 
to ensure that there's less erosion and the water's delivered to the locations where we feel trees can survive in little microclimates. Next slide, please. So right now, you know, we're kind of in a place where we're not ready to get started doing the work. Actually, this Thursday, the state of California is going to be coming with large excavators and dump trucks, and they're going to be removing the burned material at the trailer site where we had our kitchen. So hopefully that will be removed um, on Thursday, but I'm going to be meeting with the lead and a crew leader also, um, a manager and a crew leader tomorrow to see if they can even get their equipment up onto the site. They may have to do some preliminary road work to even get their equipment up there. So we're not really ready to accept guests yet, but my hope is that within a month, we will be able to start working on some of these, you know, brush removal and getting back to doing some, you know, soil practices. And the plan is that in early spring, we're gonna be having a data collection palooza. And we'll be working with academics and working with citizen scientists to collect all kinds of data about what is left, you know, after the fire and the flood that we've experienced so that we can measure our outcomes. And I'm really hoping that you, know, you can all join us at some point at some camp close to you around the world. And you're always welcome to contact us at Hotlum and find a way to join in this social movement. Next slide, please. And I'm finished. So thank you for your attendance and attention to this very difficult presentation for me. Um, it's very, very emotional to talk about what has happened. You know, for a, over a hundred years, this land has been impacted. And in the last six months, it's really come to a head. So thank you for, for your time. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It You're really very is. Um, always a pleasure working with you and we've been in close contact as this has been developing um, and we've we've seen that these changes happen in, in real time. Um, and I imagine that the folks here have questions for you about how, how that process went, um, where you're looking to go in the future with your activities. Um, I want to give the first question and, and comments to John. And then um, if folks have questions, um, we'll take some in the chat. If you'd like to also get into the question line, um, please virtually raise your hand um, and, and we'll make sure we get the, the conversation going. Well, I just wanna say thank you, Jonathan, and uh, please anybody else who wants to ask questions, I, I, I can talk later if necessary. So I'll start a question. Um, we don't see anyone else jumping in. Oh, I see Susan has a question. Please go ahead, Susan. Nice to see you. Hi, Jonathan. Great, great presentation. Thank you so much. I'm calling in from uh, Paradise, California. And we met up at Bear Creek a few weeks back when you were there with uh, Matthew Trump's um, permaculture class. You know. Um, since you are um, you're so involved with the uh, eco psychology, I was wondering um, if you could just say a few words about how we can, um, with all of the with all of the destruction and disaster that we have around us, how can we um, help each other uh, be resilient and and pick ourselves up and start over again. I think of you, you know, working for years on that piece of property and then watching, watching it all go up and smoke in a, in, in a day. And, and um, 
um, you know, my just my heart breaks for you, and and I just wonder how we can support each other in um, in learning to to um, to survive this these just this destruction. Yeah, these are important questions. Thank you, Susan. I believe that locations like Butte County, where I've spent a lot of time, including post the lava fire, is a forerunner in how to have a community that's developing resilience. Even though there's tens of thousands of people still homeless in Butte County, there are organizations like CHAT that are working to house people and to even provide showers for people in a supposedly developed country, having, you know, people not even having access to hygiene is a pretty profound shift. And so I think, you know, first and foremost, we need to provide safety and shelter, nutrition, hygiene. And then secondly, I think we need to develop community responses that are a emotional support system. I think that the co-opting of health by corporate interest has entered strongly into mental health. And traditionally, our mental health was held in community by our community, by our elders, by the grandmothers and the healers that supported us. And in, I think, intact, healthy cultures, that system's in place. And I think we need to reestablish community dialogues. It's one of the things I love about Deep Adaptation and the Deep Adaptation Forum is they're having online Zoom meetings that are emotional support and resiliency meetings for those who really feel like, you know, we're passing the tipping point and we need to come together and care for one another. And I think that any way we can find to do that outside is really important. The Machupta practices of tending the land are really important in the area of Butte County and supporting Alley Meters Night and her trainings on traditional ecological knowledge are really important. And I would encourage us to delve into ways that our ancestors not only cared for the land, but cared for one another. Thank you both. I see Skeeter, welcome. Um, you have your hand, please go ahead um, and make sure you unmute yourself. Hello, Jonathan and John D. Lou. Hey. I just spent time with you at Camp Hotlam before the fire. And I would just like to tell everybody that if at all possible, we should try to spend time in places that are close to wilderness. Wilderness is a concept, but a place that wild is really at sway and Camp Hotlam certainly meets that. And John D. Liu has done so much for the world and so much for the movements. Salutes to you, John. It was wonderful that you got to spend that time there at Camp Hotlam, marooned in the next to the wilderness, far from the from the pathways of civilization. So there, I would tell a parable that in the future or in the present, the most privileged people in a sense are those that get to live in close to wild areas and, and in wild places and don't have jobs and they get to do what they want to do. And so that's what we want to, uh, and for those places that don't have the wilderness, which are so many, we need to help recreate it. And so we're in that process, a several thousand year process of the world retaining its uh, beauty and elegance and, uh, harmony it once had. So looking forward to the next couple thousand years working with all of you. And uh, Jonathan, one thought came to mind. 
you're going to have a lot of plants come up this next spring, including a large flush of wildflowers that only come up after fire. And so it's really important to identify all those, those fire uh, species and collect amounts of seed from it for, for the future and for other places. So whenever there's a fire, there's usually a profusion of a certain species of plants that only come up uh, in thick after the fire. And so you, you learn part of that, that succession is what comes up right after the fire. And so we, that's something to pay attention to folks if hopefully no fire comes to your place. And so, um, yeah, just a couple of comments, uh, but thank you, uh, thank you both. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I wanna say that I was privileged to be able to spend 10 days with Michael in North Central Washington State at a drylands permaculture course. And we were able to have conversations with permaculture experts from around the world. And I've invited an expert in the area, a retired botanist of the National Forest Service, who is a renowned expert in the plants of this area. And she's gonna be leading a course with um, some students, some university students studying the plants in the area. And then we're hoping to have some citizen science programs where people are gonna be identifying plants and looking for rare species. And we have yet to develop any kind of a program for seed collection. And so I'd be very interested in, in talking to you about how to go about doing that probably a little later in the summer would be the appropriate time. So thank you for that, Michael. You bet. I, th I think Rose Allen had a, had a question earlier. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I was, it was actually supposed to be a uh, sort of an applauding uh, comment, but while I'm on, um, I'd be interested in finding out how we can uh, be notified of uh, future happenings at the camp and uh, maybe get on a list for potentially uh, being able to uh, go to the camp at the appropriate time to uh, help out. Thank you. Yeah, at the end of the slideshow, I had um, put our contact information. And so you can certainly um, contact us at hotlum.ca at gmail.com or phone us up. Um, you can also reach us through Ecosystem Restoration Camps. We have a web page on their website, ecosystemrestorationcamps.org. I wonder if it's, Jonathan, do you think it would be a good idea to have a Friends of Camp Hotlum group that uh, could maybe help with some, I don't know, fundraising or, or publicity or whatever, whatever is needed in the future? We have a Facebook group that I can invite you to called Friends of Hotlum. Good. And that's typically people who have actually been to Hotlum and who are really interested in, in what we're doing and they've made the effort to come to Hotlum. And then we have a following Hotlum um, group on Facebook that's more general kind of conceptual stuff. And as far as you know, having a support group that are committed, I'm actually moving toward forming a nonprofit organization and holding this land in trust in perpetuity. And I'm looking for board members. So if anybody would like to join in forming a nonprofit organization that would ultimately steward this property, um, I'd be very, very interested in talking to them. And that you know, could be you know, something akin to the Friends of Hotlum, raising funds and raising awareness and developing programs and working with the National Forest Service and academia and citizens who want to participate in a restoration project on the north side of Mount Shasta. It looks like Mark Dinkins is raising his hand. 
good night to you. Uh, I'm in Holland. Uh, it seems that my camera is not working. Um, I was wondering the biochar that you produce. Um, what I saw in the uh, video was that it's uh, burning in open air. Um, are you catching uh, the wood vinegar that is coming out of the biochar? No, we're not. Um, we're currently using a flame cap kiln. Um, the current version that we're using right now is Kelpie Wilson's Ring of Fire. We were using Ken Carloni's kiln, um, which is a little bit easier for a single person to move. Um, but that melted in the fire and we don't have the $1,200 to build another one. Um, but those are mobile kilns that are designed to try to burn efficiently, but they have no catchment system because they're open to the ground. So we, we haven't really pursued anything around a kiln that um, captures the, the wood vinegar or you know, other byproducts of the burning, including heat. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, are you familiar with the uh, forest methodology that Akira Miyawaki has developed over time? I am, and kind of the prevailing um, theory in civiculture in this area is that allowing the trees less competition and wide spacing and even eradicating the other plants around the trees is the methodology that's using. And I think his methods are quite unorthodox, um, but certainly what we can do being privately held land is we can do small control studies on different plots. So we could do one area with one treatment and another area with another treatment and compare those and compare them also against a control plot that would be on public lands that is untreated. Okay. Um, in the Netherlands where I am, uh, we did some experiments with tiny forests, which are based on the theories of uh, Akira Miyawaki. Um, and because of the density of the plantation, of a variety of all kinds of different shrubs and trees. Um, we have a different climate, of course. We are in a temperate climate. Um, but the growth of uh, these forests is phenomenal. Um, and it's mainly uh, caused by the fact that the sun uh, is not able to reach the soil anymore. It, the, you create a very quickly a shadow that uh, preserves water. Yeah, I've, I've talked extensively about shade and trying to restore the hydrological cycle due to having no canopy. And we do have a pioneer species, the manzanita, which does provide some modicum of a cover for seedlings yet they um, tend to outcompete the seedlings. Um, we have a very um, porous, sandy soil that doesn't retain a lot of moisture. The other issue we have is that there is planting styles where they plant trees very, very close together in a plantation and it's a monocrop. And so they're same species, same age, and they grow in such a thicket that with our fire ecology, if there is a fire event, it's complete devastation. So ultimately, this is kind of a, a dry um, area where trees are more sparsely populated. But then against you know, some of the microclimates that are facing north on the escarpment, the trees were growing um, thicker. And the question you know, always is, you know, do you remove what they're called dog hairs and the small trees to try to thin things out to produce the 
you know, the great stands of large trees that were typical here over a hundred years ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah, appreciate the question. Ezekiel? I just want to say uh, to Jonathan, thank you for that really amazing presentation. Uh, I, I know we, we had a chance to speak a couple of weeks ago and, and I was really um, uh, really touched by the both what you said there and, and the way that you you presented this year. It, it's clear how much you care about about Hotlum and the um, the work that you're doing is is really extraordinary. So thank you for sharing it with us. Um, and I guess my, my question is, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the ways that you can kind of use parts of it as a as sort of a control plot and, and sort of to, to study different planting methods. Are you thinking of what are the ways that you're going to record that information um, for for use for other people? Is is that sort of one of your visions for it, or or do you, is that more of a more of a side thing? And and if you did, how how would you record it and and share it out? Yeah, these are really important questions. And it's one of the reasons why I'm working with ecosystem restoration camps, which is encouraging testing and data collection. And I think the other thing that I would like to do is to work with academics who wanna do longitudinal studies through a university and to produce papers. So both, um, you know, organizationally keeping records and then, you know, creating academic records are important. But lastly, I think that also citizen science has a role to play in using applications where you can document the existence of um, species and such on a cell phone are important. Um, Lauren mapped all of the stumps and the majority of the trees on the western um, area of the land. So, you know, there's certainly a, a, a wide approach right now of how to, you know, collect the data and in, in particular store the data. Certainly open to ideas. Thanks, Jonathan. I think one of the, the things that's really, um, that I'm really excited about in seeing the future of um, work with Hotlum is this tinkering that you're talking about. Um, so combining both a scientific approach, but also a practical app applied approach where you can explore a couple of different options, a couple of different treatments and, and observe what's going on in the landscape and see which one you want to you know, bring further um, into your practice. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that um, data and observation informed approach going forward. Um, do we have any other comments? I see some folks um, sharing their thanks um, in the chat. Um, I see Tim, you're raising your hand. Um, and um, we have some other comments that people have added here about um, their experience in other regions and seeing regeneration happening in Portugal. So I just wanted to mention that um, before we um, go into the next um, set of comments. So Tim, go ahead, please. I saw you had your hand up um, and then we see Mike. All right, thank you. Good to see you again, Aaron. Good to see you. And and uh, and all of you, good to see you, Jonathan and and John and and Michael and everyone. Um, just a, a couple thoughts to add. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, good to see you, Jonathan. A um, uh, couple thoughts to share. So you know, like you said with Mark, you know, there's a lot less rainfall there. Fire ecology, whole different kind of ball game. But when I I know when I visited, I uh, didn't get a chance to see you there, but. Um, the time I got to visit with John. And I remember we were talking about these manzanita thickets um, and and uh, how hot it burns. You know, as a wildland firefighter for a few years, um, uh, I, I've seen, you know, different patches where it's like, okay, that's gonna be wildfire popping next, uh, next year. But 
some places and it's especially where you see these manzanita thickets that for the last century like you said have have not seen fire because of different management um there's it's such a hot if you've experienced manzanita such a dense high btu high heat uh, wood with really oily leaves all over like you said in the video jonathan and so it just i can tell you when i've seen the soil after those kind of patches out out in a wildfire um there's no organic matter you know the, like you said the ash blo blows away but there's it is mineral it's gray there is nothing dark in that if you go down so in those cases i wouldn't expect much wildflowers but definitely be looking where it burned a little cooler um and then the other thing i just want to add um and i'd love to talk just talk more and and uh, just get to know you better but um the th one key thing to keep in mind is the burnt snags uh salvage logging is one of the worst terms ever you know um those are sort of key to the natural regeneration part of the healing they're sort of these nucleation points of life so you have these stands of biochar that the bugs come the birds come they drop poop with seeds the biochar falls so they become these sort of nucleation points of life that in a normal forest system in these fire ecologies you're going to get a mosaic of that where you get crown fires here and there but not everywhere like we do today um, and those parts are habitat for certain things too and they also there's that process of, of regeneration and all that char that, like you, when i see a mill with a bunch of these burnt logs it's like oh my goodness those aren't doing their job for that healing and now we really have a desert when we take it so I know I'm not saying you're going to cut them, but in the planting, it just give them space as kind of these nucleation points to observe and to learn with together as this process, as the natural processes and the human processes all work together. And I, I love everything about what you said, including a ecological approach to a social problem. So um, just thanks so much for all you be and I uh, look forward to spending more time with you. And uh, just wanted to share those couple initial thoughts about what fire ecology and um, yeah. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, one of the things that's really important is having enough snags in a given area, even if you have a, a living forest that's young and healthy. I have friends that recruit snags and kill off a tree in order to provide a snag. Um, the, the timber harvest requirements in California require that you have a number of snags per acre. Um, we have a lot of snags. I think one of the things that I'm exploring is bringing some of the snags that are up in the lava flow where we were overstocked and utilizing those down below to increase biomass where the prime, the, the majority of the extraction of timber occurred and where the soil damage occurred. The interesting thing about lava is that it provides like this massive rock mulching and there was very little impact to what nutrients are underneath the lava when they did remove trees there. And so the trees actually do better up in the lava than they do down on the Delaney soil. And so the question is, how do we kind of spread that wealth of biomass? And so that's one of the things that we're exploring, utilizing biochar, utilizing just laying the logs down, using them for some of the swales, to direct water, um, trying to be creative with, you know, again, this kind of migration that we're all experiencing. Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to add one more thing. It's interesting that now you have this whole other sort of project on your hand. I think you were really on the right track with uh, mitigating the fuels, turning it into biochar, getting all that going. There was talk of maybe hosting prescribed fire training exchanges, uh, you know, and that over time, this wouldn't have happened if, if that fire came through. Um, so you were on the right track, but it's I just blessings on the journey for this new phase. And um, I'm sure there's a whole bunch to learn. So thank you so much. I just want to say hi to everyone. Um, and um, yeah, the work that we did. <laughs> this is why I've been on video. Hotland's a special place, and we were doing really good work there. Um, and I want to respond about the wildflowers. Um, 
I came back up in July um, to see the land and um, there was dogwood blooming, like blooming. And, um, you know, I had identified all the plants there and um, I hadn't actually seen any dogwood. <laughs> so um, that surprised me. Um, so I'm very curious to see what wildflowers will come back and um, how Hanlon will regenerate. So, and that was a really good presentation, Jonathan. Really good. You done good. And love to all of you. I know a lot of you. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. You know, one of the things we noticed is that the bitter cherry is popping up everywhere and providing forage for the deer. There's very little, you know, food for animals and um, been seeing deer tracks and a lot of, um, you know, munched on, you know, brush that has started to return quite quickly. Um, I see, Michael, you have your hand raised as well. Yes, well, I expect nothing but the best from Jonathan. He is a superb you know, caretaker of the land there. And um, I just wanted to point out something that Masanubu Fukuoka said. Masanubu Fukuoka, once for our revolution, many of us know of him uh, in Japan. And one of the, th I, I, one of the, he, I have three sayings from him he used a lot. He said, do nothing was one of them. That was just a quote. Another was, what can we not do? He's really trying to, um, how do we work with more nature and less maybe, uh, we need a form of agriculture and a form of living that is so really in sync with the nature and he, but his quote uh, that we can all take is observe everything. He said, do nothing, observe everything. And the next sentence or the next statement. So the more observation we can do, the more we can learn and we'll just keep sharing that with each other. Um, we're, um, we're all on a, on, a, on a big pathway here. And I, I guess I must say that Yes, wildflowers don't pop up after every fire. There's so many different kinds of ecosystems. And what, what is the seed bank? Every ecosystem has a seed bank. What is the seed in that seed bank? Some places have, it might be where there's very little seed bank left in that, and where you had the mineral destroying, where you're down to like really mineral soil. So where there's all these different ranges of different kinds of seed banks in our soils. And so we should all study seed banks and we should all study what are the weeds in our areas and which ones are edible. Because if things get tough, you wanna to know which ones are edible. Okay, so love y'all, thanks. Um, I, I just like to mention something. One of the most exciting things I ever saw was in Kerala in India, where at the Garukala Botanical Sanctuary, the local people were just going out and gathering the seeds and making cuttings of the most endangered species from the region. And I, I really hope that all ecosystem restoration camps will follow this kind of understanding that if they go out and they identify, and it's easy, you just get the IUCN and the, the native plant societies um recommendations of what are the most endangered species find somebody like michael polarski to help you who knows how to go out and identify all those plants and and knows about the scarification or the and propagation methodologies and then carefully don't don't damage stands of the plants but get carefully get a few examples and and begin to grow them and begin to propagate them and turn the camps into uh, um, 
botanical sanctuaries because in five to ten years you're going to be the most valuable places in in the region and if if the society and and the doesn't understand it now they will eventually because they're going to need the, the that that genome in order to be sustainable so we have a huge and wonderful opportunity to continue this i'd also say one more thing if i may that um, we're working on creating a, a media collective that's going to allow us to gather media materials from all over the place and distribute it worldwide. And I've been asked to be on several boards now, the board of the uh, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and the board of a of a new streaming service called Ecoflix. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is gather all, all create, create a platform where we can have a continuous public dialogue, where we can remove all the anger and fake news and, and self-serving publicity and PR stuff and commercialism and just have raise the collective intelligence of humanity. I think this is so uh, anybody who's interested in that, get in touch with me. Um, I think everybody knows how to reach me. But if you don't, my email is John D. Liu, all one word at iCloud.com. I'll put it in the chat. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think it's so important for us to be able to find ways to share these stories to make the action both local, um, but also make sure that we are, are bringing that to a, a wider audience. So thank you for, for that work. Um, I want to see if I don't see any last burning questions in the, in the group here. Um, so I want to thank Jonathan for his presentation and um, our participants. Yes, thank you. Um, and for the folks who were able to join us today and for your comments and participation. Um, um, excuse me, Aaron. Go ahead, John. Yeah. I just wonder if anybody wants to stay around and just have a free conversation. Um, I think some of us could hang out a bit if, if it's okay to use this site for a little while. Absolutely. Longer. Yes, we will, we will leave it open. Um, so you can continue your conversation until folks feel um, ready to leave. Um, and we will make mark this point in case um, anybody needs to get food or a bathroom break or, or do some of their other um, activities. So um, I also wanted to remind you all that um, Jonathan identified a couple of activities they're going to be doing in the spring. Um, so ecosystem restoration camp will be accompanying um, those activities, we will um, definitely want to support your data collection palooza and get that um, word out. And if you have connections in the audience um, for groups that might be interested to support those types of activities, um, please make sure to put us in contact with them um, or Jonathan directly. Um, they've got a lot of citizen science ahead of them, seed collection, um, and landscape observation coming up. So um, that's what we're, that's what this network is here to support. Um, so thank you guys so much for being here. We'll officially close the session now. Um, and uh, now you can continue with the rest of the conversation for folks who wanna stay. Thank you, Erin. And as John says, now for the after party.